Hi, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Leadership Revealed. I'm absolutely excited and thrilled to be welcoming you to meet uh, Nicholas Yanni today. Um, I'm not going to go too much into detail about who he is and what he's done, except for he's wrote an exceptional book, Leader is Healer. So without further ado, Nicholas, how are you? Great to be here, John Paul. Thank you very much. I'm good. Looking forward to our conversation. As am I, as am I. Um, so, Nicholas, for those that haven't met you across um, uh, or, or read your book, can you just give us an introduction about you, your history? Because, you know, I've been, I've read your book, I've done a lot of research online, and you've got an exceptional past in terms of being an educator and a teacher and, and now a successful author. Right. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> I mean, very briefly, um, I was brought up in an artistic family. My father was a filmmaker, made a lot of famous films. Um, so I went into the theatre. You can't follow a famous father. <laughs> and uh, 20 years or so, I was a theatre director and teacher. But I was really focused on, it was kind of almost research, really. I was focused on what was the optimum state the actor could get into. A bit like in sports, they speak yeah. of the zone. So I really researched that for 20 years because when an actor would enter that kind of zone, it was incredible, just like a, you witness a musician in that. They become almost like a channel. Mm -hmm. And then not in a way I planned or expected, and I won't go into the whole story of how, <clears throat> but a small group of us started working with senior executives. And, um, we gradually learned how to do it. And we actually created a very unique methodology at that point where we use Shakespeare stories. Um, we created a brand called Mythodrama, which is quite well known now. And um, we left the theater in 2001 and created the consultancy and grew and grew very fast. And then about five, six years ago, I left and, and just to focus on my own work, which is, has been based on deep presence and now kind of goes to a new place with leader as healer. And I work, um, I work with, you know, generally very senior executives. I do one-to-one -one coaching. I work with top teams. I'm just about to lead a retreat this week with a group of lawyers actually from all over Europe in a program called leader as healer. So I think that's very interesting how times are are changing mm -hmm. they're completely ready to do that and i teach at two two of the top business schools the imd in switzerland and oxford university said business school and i love those because i have leaders from all over the world mm -hmm. yeah That's fantastic can you give us a little bit of a premise about leader is healer because it's yes. I've read it and we've had a bit of a chat off right screen and, and the present thing is really really ah. important for executives right. to hear. Okay, sure. <clears throat> you know, so there's one thing I would say that, that I meet everywhere, actually even all over the world. And that's the fact that all the leaders I meet are operating from what I call a narrow bandwidth. And what I mean by that is that their thinking mind is their primary way of relating to the world. Like everything is thinking, thinking, thinking. And our feeling, emotional self, our physical sensing self, our intuition, our capacity to rest in what I would call more transpersonal space is all relegated. It's kind of put to the outer fringe. And we've normalized that. The problem is we've normalized that. So we don't question it. And yet it's actually it's completely dysfunctional, particularly as we get more and more complex and more and more challenging. We want to, we want to manage everything through our thinking. Einstein asked a very crucial question. He said, is your thinking your master or your servant? And in 99% of the people I meet in the corporate world, thinking is the master. So it's like all the other parts have gone offline. And I call that a narrow bandwidth because we're, we're operating, we're navigating with this narrow bandwidth, which we, to say again, we've normalized. And it's as though we, <clears throat> no, it's not as though we have forgotten, in my opinion, 
that our thinking does not experience anything. That's not the purpose of thinking. I can't feel you. I can't relate to you properly with my thinking alone. Relating is a completely um, multi-intelligence uh, process. I don't relate to someone through thinking. We think about each other. We think about ideas, wonderful. But relating presence, you know, my definition of presence is I'm here and I'm available. Mm -hmm. But what does it mean I'm here? It means I'm embodied. We lose contact with our bodies. Mm -hmm. Someone said to me the other day, oh, my body just carries my brain around. Yeah, that's the sad state of affairs. Yeah. And we go to the gym and we do stuff to our body. It's not the same as being embodied. You think of your great favorite musician. You think of, yeah, when you like to go and see someone and you get such a hit from their performance, I guarantee you one of the foundations is they are embodied. Yeah. They're feeling everything in their body. We're disconnected from our emotions. We have all these ideas about positive and negative emotion. We're disconnected from intuition and so on. Presence is I am here with all of me, all of me online, operating in a coherent, interdependent whole. And therefore, I'm available. Most people have no idea what real listening means, for instance. Mm. Because real listening involves all of my faculties, not just my thinking, not just my speaking. And then there's a deeper level of availability, which is to, you know, with the way we say in English, the idea came to me. Yes. So we throw that phrase out a lot, but it has a very deep implication. It means that actually I'm quite receptive like in a shower or when I'm exercising, oh, and suddenly ideas come to me because I'm available. And they don't, you know, innovation, creativity, we don't do it. We become available for it. That's a huge switch of mindset. In essence, you know, I talk a lot about doing and being, and we're absolutely over-dominated by doing. And we've lost a sense for the most part of being, being, and how they need to actually work together, doing and being need to become a kind of fluid whole. Yeah. I absolutely agree. With that. One, one of the things that I talk about with, with my clients is, is effectively have a lot of gaps in your diary, because right. if you absolutely cram your diary and you can't be present, you're thinking about the previous meeting, you're thinking right. about the forward meeting, and what a lot of people think is it's efficient to cram all the meetings in, I mean, you look at my diary, I've probably got two, three hours a day where there's just yellow space. Fantastic. And I'll, I'll, you know, I'll read one of them or I'll sit down or I'll think about stuff. And a lot of my best ideas and best sort of plans come when I've... My, my wife thinks I don't do anything in this office, but I am, I'm actually thinking. Absolutely. No, it's so important what you're saying. And, you know, you use the word efficiency and we have a totally dysfunctional concept of efficiency. Yeah. It's like, um, I remember one of my CEO clients at the beginning, I said to her, you know, you need to take up meditation. And she was like, no, listen, I have a child. I can't, I haven't got time. I said, I promise you, I promise you, if you really meditate at least 20 minutes every day, I guarantee you, you get much more done with much less effort and with much higher attunement. Mm -hmm. Four months later or something, she said, Nicholas, you were right. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. you know, that's how it is distorted. I've got to do more because yeah. then I'll be more efficient. It's nonsense. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I love what you're saying. It's a little bit like the gym analogy. Um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a bit of a gym bunny. I just love going there. And okay. one of the things I see is um, is the, the kids coming in and they've got the phones on, they've got the mobile phones, and you, you can't, you've got to be in, I know it sounds really simple, silly, but Arnold Schwarzenegger used to talk about being at one with the muscle. Exactly, I remember. Yeah, and I put my earphones in, even if I'm not listening or anything, just so people don't talk to me. I'm not being rude. I'm, our class going to the gym effectively is a job. You know, you get in, you do the best of your ability, you give it everything you've got, 
And I think it's it's this peak performance in sport as well. You yes, see you're absolutely their, right. Yeah. You see somebody at their peak performance, it's so impressive. Exactly. It, it, yes, let's come back to that. Actually, I remember a quote by Schwarzenegger where he said something like, a muscle worked consciously is worth a hundred times more than a hundred muscles worked, you know, listening to something else. Yeah, that's good. I like Absolutely. That. But yes, you, it's lovely what you said. You get something, you do. Like when you're in the presence, even of, even of a leader who is really present, first of all, you feel listened to. Mm -hmm. You feel received. That's priceless. That's priceless. And everyone knows that. When I say this to a group, remember leaders who you maybe you met them in the corridor for one minute, but in that one minute, they were present with you. Yeah. Yeah. They weren't thinking about something else. They weren't rushing to do the next thing. It's really good. It's actually so sort of brilliant to hear this. We did it. We opened one of our branches and we got um, Rishi Sunak, the chancellor, yeah. to come down and open it. And he was very present. So he, we, we got told we've, we had a secret service like the day before, names of everyone, yeah. you know how it works. Um, and we said, we've got 15 minutes. He was going to shake hands, open, that was it. He was literally with us half an hour. He spoke with every single person. Um, so I think one of the security guards came over, whispered something to his ear, and he was like, no, no, I'm fine. And he kept on talking to us. And every single person that was at that opening of, of our, our uh, uh, company turned around and said what a lovely person he was just because he was present and he'd give us the time. You see, I, that's exactly it. And putting politics aside, yeah. yes. <laughs> he is one of the few politicians who I've been impressed by exactly yeah. because of that. Even at the beginning of the pandemic, the yes. way he showed up, you felt that kind of quality yeah. in him. And it's rare, to be honest. Well, he, he did something else that absolutely blew my mind. So he had his, his sort of security, about four or five of them. And my wife and my youngest, Bello, six, came. Um, and everybody was going away. And I said, oh, Rishi, would you mind if I got, I got a photograph with my family? And yeah, and he said yes. And the photographer went and the security guard went. And he didn't just take a photograph. He literally bent down and he had probably, it felt like about three minutes, but it was probably about 20 seconds chat with my daughter. You know, do you like the balloons? Because we have balloons and stuff. That again just left a big impression because he was present. There was no paparazzi around. His photographer wasn't there. We had one of our guys with my eye, um, my phone, so it was, you know, it wasn't like publicity stunt. And again, it's just, I think that's a big part of being a good leader is is listening. And being I couldn't present. agree more. I couldn't agree more. I'm here and I'm available. So how do we get better at it? For all those people that are listening, that say, do you know what, Nicholas? I, I, I get it. It resonates with me. How do I do it? How do I get into that state of being more present with my team? Right. Well, in a way, that's exactly what the book is about. Yes. Um, <clears throat> just to, in a way, to go back to your first question, why do I call the book Leader as Healer? When I speak of healing, I'm obviously not meaning physical healing. I'm meaning a healing of this fragmentation mm. where we have all these parts of us that are either offline or not in a coherence so in a way the chapters of the book are kind of with practical exercises guide yes. way through the answer to your question so it needs a lot of introspection it needs a willingness to change it needs an understanding of why i think well you already and between us i think we already made a strong case for it um and then it needs consistent application. It, you know, it needs, okay, I need to be more embodied. What does that mean? Like, let's say I go running three or four times a week, take the earphones out. Mm. If you're in nature, relate, feel the wind, the rain, the sun, whatever it is, feel your breathing, get into your body while you're running. That's priceless as well. Mm -hmm. um do some emotional work you know in in this work with the, that i do with leaders it's often the one of the most important um parts of the work because we are all carrying let's say unattended emotional scars we tend to operate trying to suppress our emotions we have mm -hmm. this idea that there are positive negative emotion no there aren't 
There aren't. If I'm sad, I need to be sad. If I'm anxious, I need to feel the anxiety. And we need to have teams where emotional authenticity is much more present. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean we need big emotional drama. For instance, very simple, you know, you imagine you're leading a team meeting and you're in a difficult phase of a project, which is pretty common now. And you as the leader are present enough that you realize there's a lot of anxiety in the room. Now, the old style leader just plows on. You know, we've got an important strategic conversation. Leader as healer says, just a moment, everyone, look, I'm anxious about where we are in this project. I'm actually not even sleeping very well. I pretty sure a lot of you are anxious. Let's just acknowledge that. That's all. Mm -hmm. So in that moment, literally and metaphorically, there's a relaxation. Oh, I don't have to fight my anxiety. Feelings don't need changing. They don't need healing. They just need including. It's so simple and yet so difficult because we got so used to fragmenting our feelings, resisting them, putting them aside. So that's a big part of the work. Now, a leader who is able to do that means they're okay with their own emotions. How often do we hear, by the way, someone say, well, my leader, I can only say this to him or her. I can't say that because he won't be comfortable with it. That's not good leadership. That means you're condemning the, the kind of terrain of the team to a narrow landscape, a narrow game board. People can't say, I'm pissed off with that, or yeah. actually, I'm really upset at the moment. No, we can't say that. She or he only likes positive news. That's ridiculously bad leadership. So leader as healer has worked enough that they're comfortable with their own emotions. And people feel that. People know I can come to you and say, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm anxious about this. And you're not going to try and fix me or or persuade me not to be, you're going to say, yeah, no, I understand. Yeah. And in that moment, we have rapport. Yeah. It's so simple and yet so difficult. <laughs> and then another part of the work is definitely to have a very committed mindfulness practice. And I teach, for instance, and it's in the book, I teach, there's one thing where you meditate, ideally 20 minutes, you know, four or five times a week, but equally important is a moment to moment practice. How do I take more control of my attention? Because mindfulness is all about paying attention, not thinking, paying attention. And I teach very simple practices, like how can I keep aware of my body whatever I'm doing. I tell people before Zoom calls, take two or three minutes, close your eyes, take a few deep breaths, feel your body, sit mm -hmm. in your chair, get in touch with your body. It's unbelievable the difference it makes. This is mindfulness moment to moment. And people who start practicing this report incredible change. Suddenly it's like they're on, on a bigger game board. They're more available instead of just being in there thinking, 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 because to relate to someone, I have to have space inside me. Relating means I receive you. That's real relating. I receive you. If I'm only busy with my thinking, I very literally don't have space inside me. Yeah. Do you think is sort of absolutely agree with that? If we just go back a couple of minutes when you, t you talked about the, um, uh, this sort of new way of, of, of leadership and, and um, being more present. Mm. My personal opinion is that, that there's a, quite a lot of toxicity in leadership at the minute, um, and even pre, even more so pre-COVID. Um, but the fact of it is it's it's quite male-dominated. Again, we're not going to get into the, that, that whole sort of debate. Um, but it is a little bit of... And I do actually feel sorry for some leaders because they feel as though they have to be the big, tough guy, very strong, just to, just to be because they think that's what a leader is. And it's not. I bet longevity of career is, is madly affected because if you're not present, um, you know, you're going to have some emotional turmoil, emotional baggage in that. Do you think there's nice, definitely a, like a sort of a paradigm shift from the old toxic masculine, we must be alpha males and tough to the new way of leadership? Yeah, I think you describe it very well. And 
I mean, we could say a lot about that, but yes, it's an old style of leadership. Yeah. I, I personally see it as the kind of mm. gradual dying of the patriarchy. Yeah. I think it's very deep what you're saying, actually. And I do think there is a change happening. It's difficult to say how quick, but it's definitely yeah. happening. Even, John Paul, that a title like leader as healer is widely accepted. Now, when the idea first came to me, which was, I think pre, it was pre-COVID, and I very tentatively mentioned it to a couple of my most senior CEO clients, really kind of wondering how they would respond. And they had an immediate yes, yes. Now, three years later, it's like, what could we need more? Yeah. So the title in itself is already a kind of symptom, I think, of a new paradigm coming in. And yes, I'm one of many who are bringing that. And it's absolutely what you said. It's a, it's a enough of this toxicity, enough of this bullshit of yeah. st strength. It's yeah. and and the saddest thing sometimes is when I work with senior women, and I see how they've compromised themselves to fit yeah. in. And I speak whenever I'm with a group. Uh, there's a point where I speak so strongly to the men. Yeah. You need to understand. You need to understand what we are doing to women. Yeah, I, I agree. My my M, my MD who runs the business for me is a woman. She's absolutely brilliant. She's you know the best manager of people I've, I've ever come across. And one thing she's very good at is being present. I've seen her where um, she's had a meeting before, and she literally she she'll physically turn a phone over so it's obvious, and she'll close the laptop, and she's she'll sit there. And and I've learned. I mean, hope, hopefully you're listening, Adele, but I have. I've learned so much from her about the way she talks to people and about how she's present, where I just want, I'm, I'm very red and, and a D on the, the, the disc profile, and so I just want the answers. But that doesn't, that's wrong. You, you know, it's not about the answers. It's about what you can do for that person as well. Yeah, yeah, that's lovely to hear. If you are listening, Adele, I honour you, <laughs> <laughs> really. Um, yeah, and also there's something in what you said there, because I've seen it time and time and time again, that someone comes looking for an answer, that actually when we engage a conversation, very often the answer starts to come. Or let's say someone comes into your office and they're upset. Now, the default Pavlovian for most people is, I want to fix you. Yes. I want to stop you being upset. But actually, I've seen time and time again and heard time and time again. No, let me first acknowledge, yeah, you're upset. I get that. Yeah. And I stopped trying to do anything. It's unbelievable how sometimes within five minutes, you, the person who was upset, you start to have a new idea. Mm. And then I think, oh, well, I didn't do anything. No, yeah. I really did do something. I related to you. This is the new yeah. paradigm. Yeah. And and it's radically different. Yeah, it's radically different. It is, but it makes so much sense. Again, when Adele Adele will phone me up and she'll say, "Have you got five minutes?" and she'll just go on a, a rant. I haven't said anything, and she'll go, "Good talk, thanks, John. I'll see you later." And that's exactly. just something you need. It's not me trying to say, "Have you thought about this?" Have you thought? Unless she asks. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. We really need to stop thinking. And you know what? When people do that, when people try and fix you. It looks like they're trying to help you, but actually most of the times they're doing it because they're uncomfortable with emotion. All right. Really? So I don't like you being upset because I, it makes, I don't know how to deal with emotion. Yeah. So I'm going to try and help you, but actually I'm doing it because I'm uncomfortable. Ah, interesting. Yeah. Most times we try and stop someone feeling in the guise of helping them. Yes. Because we're not comfortable. Often the basic, most important thing with someone who is emotional is just be with them. Yeah. Be present. Yeah. Be present. And nine times out of 10, the emotion naturally passes and then they feel very open and relaxed. We know that. We know it. People have a good cry. You feel much better. Yeah. You know it, but in the workplace, somehow it goes out of the window in the name of this God of efficiency. And macho BS. As well. <laughs> yeah. So re relating that to the industry of the majority of the people that, that watch and listen to the YouTube and the podcast, which is real estate, um, 
report is so so important especially now because of the rise of the cheap fee agent there's not a lot of stock in the market so it's like a bit of a cutthroat industry at the minute um, and we all know that people buy from people and if you have that connection build that rapport um, then you're more likely to gain the business so this type of of, of leadership mm-hmm. this is so so important in, in this like sort of post-covid world isn't it right i couldn't agree more and i see it, of course in your profession absolutely and you know it's also very important to say that you cannot fake this yeah it's not a behavior that you can learn. Presences that I'm settled in myself and I'm genuinely interested in you. Mm-hmm. And I'm interested in what you want. And I'm interested in trying to help you, not sell to you. I think the worst thing is when people feel, oh, he or she just wants to sell. Yeah. No, relating is I'm genuinely interested. I say to all leaders, if you're not curious about people, don't be a leader. Uh, You know, people are amazing. I make, I mean, I wasn't like this before at all, but I've got to a point now where I can go to any party or whatever. And I really just am so interested in people mm. because people are fascinating. If we're available, everyone is interesting. Mm-hmm. Everyone has a life story, taxi driver, shopkeeper. Yes. So that's a crucial quality of presence. I'm here and I will listen to you. I listen to you. I don't just give you my spiel. Yeah. I listen to you. And that I think that's priceless in your profession. Yes. I know it would be for me as a, as a client. Anytime someone is trying to sell me something, the worst thing is when I feel they're not making a rapport. I'm immediately alienated. Yeah, it's a good I had this here, to be honest, we're renovating our house and a guy came to talk about wood burners and no, he was just arrogant, smooth. And I'm seriously thinking now, although they have the best reputation, now I'm looking for another supplier. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> yeah, good, good, friend, good friend of mine, Matt Giggs, he talks about if you want to be, if you love property, become a surveyor. If you love, a, if you love people, become an estate agent. That's and great. I love that. It's it's brilliant because a lot. Of, oh, I love property, so I'm going to become an estate agent. Yeah. You deal with people, a hell of a lot. Yeah, yeah. Property, but you know the other thing as well, and I'm sure you. I think you'll agree anyway. Is that when you operate like that, it's enjoyable. Brilliant. Because making rapport with people is fundamentally enjoyable. Yeah. Oh, I love it. I mean, I don't get involved in the day-to-day run of the business that I've got an MD and a, an amazing team, but we've just taken on um, sort of a, effectively, it's like a, a, a franchise fine in country. They sell a lot of the high-end properties and stuff. And I'm always interested in how successful people have got yeah. where they were, see if I can I can learn anything. So I've actually, you know, got involved a bit more than I normally would just so I can deal with the clients. And I'm genuinely interested. Forget the property. I want to know about you. And right. we're actually doing pretty well. We're getting a lot of business on at a lot higher fee just because the people are saying, oh, we're relating to you and your company and the business. But I'm generally interested when you walk into this amazing property, where did, what humble beginnings did you come from and where yeah. you've got to? Exactly, exactly. And I think in the wider picture, it's, we know now from research that the customer experience is becoming more and more crucial. Yeah. And organizations that are not paying attention to that are heading for, for, for downfall, basically. Totally agree. One, one of the things that you know I, I speak about is crafting that the world-class customer experience. So if, if I phoned, if you phoned us up for evaluation, I'll say, great, thank you, Nicholas. I'll see you next Wednesday at four o'clock. What happens then? Do I just rock up at four o'clock next Wednesday? Or are we doing lots of wow moments in between then? So when I when I rock up at four o'clock, you're like, bloody hell, I've got your, your hand-delivered brochure, I've got your little WhatsApp video, I've had a couple of really nice, lovely text messages, I've had a, this card or that letter. And so when I rock up, you feel as though that report... I mean, you're talking marginal gains. You're not You're not thinking I'm a you know, a long-lost brother or anything, but you are thinking, oh, this guy's a decent chap. Exactly, exactly. It's yeah. lovely to hear, yeah. Yeah. So one question is, you, you talk about uh, practice creating space, so we're not that... That hemmed in in that false that false lie of efficiency um 
I know we've gone over a little bit of tips and, and guys, I really, really urge you to, uh, to, to buy this book. We're going to put all the links in the, um, in the descriptions below, but Nicholas, if you wouldn't mind, just tell us a little bit about how we would, or how somebody at home could literally practice creating space now. Great. So you up for a little exercise? Well, go on then. I don't know. No, very, simple, <laughs> very simple, very simple, very simple, really. Okay. You don't have to close your eyes. Do if you want, but just start to notice for a moment. Pay attention to your breathing for a moment. Right. I will. I will close my eyes. I'll probably As you do wish. It. No, don't. Only if you're comfortable. Just pay attention. That's all you have to do is notice your in breath and your out breath. Notice what happens in your body. Like you're curious to discover. Ah, all of these sensations happen. Now notice. You're sitting, like notice your contact with your chair. Yeah. And then with your breathing, just let your out breath be a bit longer. Yeah, so as you breathe out, you're good. You drop down. I have a feeling that yeah. you kind of drop down inside. And imagine now that as you do this, you're on what I call a backward circle. So instead of going out to meet the world like that, yeah. you're actually coming back and you're going down. Just drop into that for a moment. Right. And the out breath is very important because when we contract the out breath, good. And you just feel a settling in your soul. Very good. That's it. That's it. Now you keep that even as you open your eyes. You, yeah, ex exactly. You choose, okay, let me stay aware of the sense of back and down. Backward circle, I call it. And people who practice this, it, it's unbelievable. It makes an extraordinary difference. And my, my invitation to people is go through the day remembering this. Yeah. So this and make it a new habit. Yeah. Make it a new habit. I was just going to say, is this something that we practice, like do this exercise a couple of times every day? No, all the time. All oh, right. <laughs> it's the idea. Just whenever you get that space. All it, the time. No, no, in in the middle of whatever you're doing. All oh, right. It's an in, it's installing a very powerful habit. Of yeah. Presence of presence. Yeah. And by the way, just to be very scientific for a moment even in those two minutes if you're if you were wired up and your brainwave frequency was being measured it changed in those two really minutes, measurably now that's interesting and that's important for people who, oh i need proof okay there's it proof measurably changes do you feel different even a little bit honestly totally different i mean you guys can't hear it but my dog's yapping out there and I couldn't hear it when I was doing it. Right. So right. that has to be the being present. Right, right, you see? So that's an incredibly powerful practice and very simple. Yeah. And I know I just started working with a, a senior VP and I gave him this practice in our first session. And he came back a week later and he said, no, it's incredible, the difference it's making. Yeah. So the only additional thing to say is to, any, to you or anyone who's listening, Find a way of reminding yourself. Yeah, just like a post it. Whether it's an app on your phone that says, you know, breathe, or yeah. you have something in your pocket, whatever it is, make it so it becomes a habit. Yeah. Really? And then at any one time in the day, ask yourself, am I, because a forward circle is, <gasps> I'm relating like that, and I think that I'm relating to the world. No, I'm not, actually. Yeah. Ask yourself, am I on a forward circle or am I on a backward circle? Yeah. You can ask that at any moment in the day internally. Yeah. Any meeting you're in, whoever you're with. Yeah. It's just so impressive the fact that these little exercises can make you feel more present, more relaxed. Isn't it? Isn't and you it? don't have to, you know, I mean, it's all contained in this book. It's it's not difficult. It's just about your 20 years worth of learnings, putting it into some simple exercise. I and the benefits so. I can say are amazing already. Yes, yes, yes. It just takes some understanding of why and then some commitment. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant. And it's a long, you know, the it's both very simple and 
like that, what we just did, I've been doing that maybe 20 years, and I'm absolutely discovering new layers of that all the time. That's lovely. Yeah. I'm in a bigger learning now than at any other time in my life. Yeah. And I, I feel very fortunate about that. Well, that just shows <laughs> what your leadership skills as well, because a lot of leaders, nope, you can't be taught anything else. No, nope, I know. Anything. That's the worst. I remember a group like that once and, and the guy said, no, I, there's no, I have nothing to learn. Whoa, yeah. that's terrible. I that's know. like, and by, well, it's another topic, but like in our marriages or close partnerships, mm -hmm. the moment we think we have nothing to know new about the person we're with, it's the end of the relationship. Oh, totally. And that's why most partnerships fail in the end, stale. Yes. But that's not about you. That's about me. Am I open to discovering you more and more and more? Well, the way I, the way I, I, I read it, I read it a fair few years ago now, because of cell reproduction, we are literally a new person every seven, eight years. Right. Even our brain cells reproduce just that's with the old sort of memories or whatever. So the, the way I look at it, and this is, again, this is why your taste buds change. So I, I use the example, I used to hate eggs as a kid. Now, poached eggs, scrambled eggs, I, I, I love them. And if we're changing as a new person, but we've still got that old way of thinking, old habits, sure. there's going to be a disconnect. Yeah, and I would say even more strongly, actually, that the more we are present, the more every day is a fresh experience. Yes. So yes. if I get to the end of the day and nothing has been really fresh or new, I need to look at, so I'm, I wasn't present. And if two people are present, let's say in a marriage, then each day it's like, what did you experience today? It's fresh. Yeah. It's fresh. Presence is I'm fresh. And I meet someone and I feel I'm discovering them, even if I already know them. No, I, I how are you today? Yeah. It's fresh. How are we as a team today? How yeah. are we really? How are we really? That's presence. And that's when teams move into higher performance. I'm not just telling you some kind of story. No, let's see how we really are. Yeah. I bet the buy-in from your, 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 your colleagues is immense when you literally sit down and you say, shut the laptop, turn the phone. I'm yours. I understand your pain. I've acknowledged your pain. How can I help? What are you looking for from me? Right, let's do this together. That. Exactly. It's, and especially now with COVID, with people leaving toxic environments and toxic right. workplaces, you know, it's, it's a retention tool as well as a recruitment tool. Well, we know there's this, I only heard it recently, the great resignation. You heard that term? Uh, no, I haven't actually. No, I was new to it. And apparently it's very well known. In the last year, there have been more people leaving jobs than ever before. It's got a, such that it's got a name. It's called the great resignation. And if you wow. Google it, you'll see all the statistics. Yeah. So exactly. I wrote that down, actually. I'm going to get Yeah, that. yeah, yeah. I was, I, I had, for some reason, I, I had noticed it. Someone told me about it recently. So you don't know that? Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. The great yeah. resignation, which is very healthy in a way. Yeah. Leaving, even if they're, it's comfortable where they are. No, it's toxic. Yes. I don't want this anymore. Yeah. We're, we're, so fine. we're in a lot of flux at the moment oh and that's the other thing i would say about the book i do believe that as things get more and more unstable also with the war that's so horrendous but the effect we need to we need inner tools to navigate mm -hmm. that give us an inner sense of being and presence because if we're relying on the outside for inner stability we're really in trouble because the outside is is crumbling more and more. Yeah, yeah. No, I agree. It's almost you've got to look after your own house. Exactly, exactly. And, and, and try not to worry about externally. But we we have to. It's we can't not. It's it's everywhere we look, and it's it's horrendous. And I, I totally agree with you. Um, but yeah, in order to build up what we've currently got, we have to have that presence and 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 that mindfulness and look internally. Totally agree with that. Exactly. Um, Nicholas, can I just say, this has been absolutely amazing. I've genuinely, genuinely loved listening to it. Um, if people want to get in touch with you, are we okay to put all your, your social media handles? Yes, I have a, like on LinkedIn, I have a newsletter. Um, my website has a lot of information, of course. Yeah, I also really enjoyed our 
wrap up. Yeah. So do keep John Paul. Oh, excellent. So, guys, strongly, if you, if you haven't got this book, you know you're absolutely crazy. You've got to get leaders a healer. It's going to make you a better CEO. It's going to if you can pass this on to your team as well. Just imagine how how truly efficient and how effective you're going to be as a, as a leader, not just cramming it all into our to our diaries. So. Nicholas, once again, on, on behalf of everybody at Leadership Reveal, I just want to say thank you very much and um, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much indeed. All the best. Thank you.